Um, and that's why I say this is a, a kind of a rebirth of that time, and you have to be able to do things a little bit differently, more quickly, um, and you know, with a real collaborative attitude. And that's where it's a lot of fun once again. It's Wednesday again, and that means that we're back for the Pencil Kings podcast. And today I'm excited to talk to Randy Gall because uh, just before we started recording here, he was telling me about how he had a hiatus from art. And I thought he was going to say he had like a six-month break, but no, it was it was much longer than that. Um, but before we get into his story, I just want to remind you that the notes for this, if you want to... Um, Anything that we mention here, any links or anything, they'll be at pencilkings.com slash Randy Gall. That'll be R-A-N-D-Y dash G-A-U-L. So um, welcome to the call, Randy. How are you doing today? Oh, thanks so much, Mitch. I'm doing great. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, catch up with you and share some stories. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into this because I know that there are people who have who want to make a, a transition. And I, I feel like just in the in the little bit that you told me about your your story that they're going to be able to relate to that to wanting to change from one thing into something else but before we get into that can you give people just like a one minute overview of some of the th- of the things that you've worked on or, or what you're working on well yeah just, just a one minute overview of like what kind of art you do uh where you're from and then we'll dive into your actual story sure sure so um boy i guess I've been at this for a long time currently, and most recently I've been working on Alice in Wonderland 2 for Sony, and Sony's working for Disney, so I've done some creature design and visual effects sequences design for that movie, and then did a little bit of work on Transformers 5 um, just a few weeks ago, and then early in the year I was working at DreamWorks on a couple of different shows there before that studio closed here in Redwood City, and in addition to that, a whole bunch of independent projects, so... They range from stop motion stuff to VR stuff to my own properties. One's an animated feature and with a bunch of other VR properties. So that's what's going on presently. But um, I graduated art school in New York from Pratt Institute many moons ago where um, I had a BFA in illustration and minors in uh, drawing and printmaking. And once I graduated there, my first job was working in a print shop, excuse me, which was pretty fun. I worked right under the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, working on a bunch of etchings and lithographs. And after that, um, sort of transitioned into teaching for a little while uh, because that was better at paying the bills than doing artwork, which was difficult. I was doing a little bit of freelance illustration as well or editorial work and young adult books and so on. And that was a real challenge, trying to make money and pay bills. And So I started um, doing some teaching work and picked up some woodworking and contracting skills and did that for 10 to 12 years. And then a crazy little twist of fate came around where I ended up uh, back in art. And uh, I'll tell you about that in a little while. Cool. So, yeah, that was a a great overview. And it sounds like you've got a lot going on, although just from the tone of your voice, you sound like a very calm, collected person and you're able to handle like anything that life throws at you. Does that sound accurate or am I off base there? Well, I would say, and thanks for that. Um, Sometimes (laughs) it's not necessarily working that way, but um, if anything, you you have to really learn how to be diverse these days. Uh, A lot of things are transitioning and changing in the industry and there's a lot of great opportunities out there. There have been some experiences that have taught me how, what to avoid and particular people to avoid, I should say, out there. So um, above all, I would imagine, you know, it's really good to have a broad set of skills in this industry now, and that encompasses theme parks and uh, games and uh, film and television and storyboards and uh, texture mapping and uh, map painting and so on, because the industry has so shifted. And so it, it sounds like you're doing so many things. And in this, is this because the industry is changing that you actually have to be a texture painter, a storyboard artist, a visual development artist? Like you, you actually need to be all of these different roles in order to keep 
the jobs going consistently or is it just this is more of a function of your personality that you're just interested in all these different things so therefore you dive into them? Yeah, I think it's a combination of all of the above, which is what you just mentioned. I mean, <clears throat> after you do work in an art department for a little while, um, it, honestly, sometimes it gets to be a little bit unchallenging. Uh, you get you get into a bit of a, um, a grind, I guess is what you could say. You know, a lot of studios tend to crank out the same kind of work over and over and over again, and there's lots of changes and iterations and you know, once you kind of get used to the stories and the brand of the studio, um, it's not necessarily as challenging as you would like it to be. And so some some studios are really cool with you uh, doing some other work on the outside. Some are not. But what I found is that in order for me to be creatively challenged, I, I love to reach out and see what else is going on. And frankly, these days, what's going on in the independent world is far more interesting than what's coming out of the major studios. And, you know, that's myself and a bunch of friends and colleagues that are out there trying to create new content, different content than what we're we're seeing out there these days. Could you give us an example of, of what you mean by the independent world having more interesting projects? Sure. Um, well, there's a couple of things that are going on in the VR world. And for for your audience here, I think that's a really great place to start looking because it doesn't really have an established culture just yet. You know, lots of companies are diving in. Some are sitting on the sidelines waiting, but it's an entirely new medium that represents some really interesting opportunities and challenges for storytelling. And, you know, some of the veterans that are coming out of the film world are <clears throat> trying to figure it out. And from a visual point of view and a design point of view, it offers some incredible opportunities that, you know, I'm starting to have conversations with some People like Google, uh, Jaunt, uh, Immersive 360, uh, Digital Domain, and uh, some others. Uh, if you look at what Oculus is doing, they did a little thing uh, called Henry, which is kind of, um, for me, disappointing in that it's what you would expect out of a major studio, I guess. Not really new or challenging uh, content, um, but some other studios are doing some stuff that's far more compelling and interesting and a place where artists can find new challenges that are outside of the, the regular studio system, you know. Yeah, definitely. I And I, I guess for people who are listening who <laughs> may not understand VR or Oculus or some of the other companies that Randy just mentioned, there's this huge change that's coming. Like we might – it might not touch you yet, but I think this Christmas is when – Things are really going to start to change when the video game consoles are, I think, officially the stuff is going to be ready for the public. And it's these helmets that you put on and finally virtual reality. You know, I forget if, if it, I think it must have been in the 90s when I first saw virtual reality in some magazine. I was like, oh, this is going to be so cool. And then once you saw what people were doing with it, it was it was actually I mean, it was still cool, but it was also kind of lame because we were just limited by a lot of things. And these days, you're not limited. And, I, and like I've had a chance to try an early Oculus, and this actually, you know, I love video games because I was feeling bored. You know, the same same thing that you're talking about. But I feel that VR, I didn't know what you meant first when you said independents are doing more exciting things. But yeah, I feel like VR is the change that. Uh, we've been waiting for in video games that is finally going to, you know, it's always just been holding this little controller in your hand and watching a box, uh, you know, the yeah. box being your TV. Yeah. And it's been like that since the beginning of video <clears throat> games. Yeah. And now, finally, it's this way more immersive experience. And if you have a chance to try out one of these, if you're, if there's, they have a demo at a mall or wherever, a convention or something, definitely it's worth standing in line to check it out because it's so different and weird like I felt like I was gonna throw up oh no when I did <laughs> I remember I was like flying through the city and there's a veloc and then th that was one demo and then there was another one where there's a velociraptors running around this urban environment and yeah I felt like I was gonna throw up I just had to take it off after a while but I mean you get past this this point but it, yeah it, it is a, a really amazing and exciting time so sorry to, to monopolize the conversation there but I, I just wanted to explain to people like this shift that we're at the beginning of this amazing revolution in how we experience media.
you know, what's happened in the industry is a lot of work, as you know, has gone overseas. And there's there's some real sort of hostility about that because it involves uh, government decisions and um, places that will subsidize productions in Canada and New Zealand and London and so on. So, you know, it costs the studios two thirds or half of what it would cost to do it here in the States. And so that we end up losing jobs here in the States or people have to migrate to other parts of the world, disrupt their families, disrupt their communities to do that. And that's a huge problem. And, you know, I'm not quite sure where all that's headed, but clearly um, something that everyone has to pay attention to who's looking to get into this industry because um, it's a, it's a big deal. But on the other hand, you get the opportunity to hear stories from all corners of the globe. So there's some really great stuff that's being written from, you know, Africa, the Far East, Latin America, Mexico, um, Europe, Russia, and beyond. And those are some really incredible stories that should be told. And guys are out there trying to figure out how to tell those stories in new ways that don't cost so much money. And on the indie side of things, that's where it gets really interesting and challenging. But you know, you you can have some great success with some fresh stories that, again, are outside of the standard sort of Disney model where, you know, you, you touch a more relevant, more global audience. Um, and that's really something that your audience should pay attention to, too, because there's great literature and great stories that are contemporary coming from all parts of the world. And so I get to talk to producers who are trying to build studios, trying to build alternative pipelines and ways of doing things less expensively. And when you look at what something like Pixar would produce, you know, those films are generally 150 to $200 million to make. It costs the studio another 200 million or so to market. So by the time it's out in theaters, it costs the studios around a half a billion dollars. So they need to be able to generate close to a billion dollars to show the kind of profits that their shareholders are looking for. And that really compresses the ability to take risks. And a lot of times, you know, I know people who are working in studios who have great ideas and the studios just don't want to tell those stories because they're, they're outside of the, the brand or kind of the, the comfort zone of, of the studio. And, you know, that's kind of what's going on with Star Wars now. Um, you know, as, as big as that franchise is, there's a lot of disinterest out there now for that because, you know, how many times do we have to visit that world and go through those same kinds of conventions? And what's what's crazy is that you got great artists who have all of the skills necessary to tell new stories and they're drawn back into these ongoing franchises that just don't represent the future. Don't don't tell the stories of kids and families today they're they're retelling stories that are 30 and 40 years old now right randy you know what's really interesting in, in listening to you talk i feel like you have such an elevated perspective of the industry at large and i'm really curious where that comes from i, I did, could never have foreseen myself asking this question when we started but it just seems like you have a really great grasp of, of everything that's happening and you're in touch with the people that are actually making these decisions and influencing things. Is this just from being in the industry for, for a, a certain period of time or is it how you're networking with people or, or what do you think it is? Because I think it's, it's definitely an enviable position because you can really, you've got your finger on the pulse of well, pretty much everything I, that's going on. I, I appreciate that. I mean, you know, one of the qualities that I really think is really crucial, not just to a passion, because, you know, you shouldn't be doing anything unless you have a passion for it, right? That's that's kind of the, the burning fuel that, you know, gets you out there doing what, what you are meant to be doing. And along with that, just as importantly, if not more so, and I'm not the first guy to say this by any means, is a tenacity to make sure that that passion is fulfilled and addressed on a, on a daily level, right? And I think I just counted, I, I worked on my 56th film at this point. And wow. that excludes anything else that I've done that's been in television, that's been in theme park or resort development or any number of other things. And, you know, the spectrum is both live action visual effects films. It's, you know, animated films. It's, you know, broad, different styles of things. And I'll tell you quickly how it happened for me was 
Um, we were living in Pennsylvania, and I had done a little bit of CD-ROM work for Disney years ago, and that was going great. And they offered uh, my myself and my family a job out in California, and the guy who was going to offer us the job said, you know, you're welcome to take the position, but I'm not sure how long CD-ROM will be at Disney Interactive because CD-ROMs were fading and console games were coming up and it was going to be a big deal. And so we decided not to take that position, stayed in Pennsylvania for a while, and things were a struggle from there trying to find work in the industry, as you can imagine. So I was driving back and forth to New York to get what work I could and eventually took my portfolio down to um, – Florida for a Seagraph conference, which is another important thing for your audience to know about too, and, and um, went down there and took a bunch of rejection letters with me that I had received from studios as I was applying for work. And I found ILM down there and I knocked on their door and they gave me an interview in their view painting, texture painting department. Um, <clears throat> and they said, you know, your work is great, but we really don't think you're a good fit for the, for the department. And of course, I was super excited that there was a job offer to work at ILM, right? But at the same time, kind of bummed out, like, well, you know, I can learn how to do that stuff, guys. Come on, it can't be that hard. And they said, no, 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 the art department is here. Why don't you go and talk with those guys? And the next day I go and I meet with uh, the two women who ran the department at that time. And I walked in with my portfolio, exactly the same portfolio that I had sent them about a month ago with my rejection letter, right? And I said to them, you know, it's great to meet you guys. I really want to learn what I need to do to be able to get a job out here in ILM and they said okay well let's let's take a look at your work and I showed them the work and I showed them the letter and they said okay this is really bizarre because we're the only two people who are authorized to send these letters out and we did not send these this letter to you and you don't see our names on this letter right and then they took a look at the work and they said we've never seen this work before either and then there was a 30 second pause and I thought oh crap you know, this isn't going to go well. They're going to say, okay, well, it's all right. Go back home and, you know, send us stuff in six months or something. And they said, when can you start? And I thought, wow. what the heck is going on with this? And so that's what I mean about the tenacity. I had a letter of rejection from them. I had to haul down, put, put the trip on my credit card to show them the same work that I had sent out there. And just through, you know, sheer luck and, you know, the desire to try and figure out why I wasn't able to get into the industry – these two kind women, uh, three weeks later, had us moved out to California, and that's you know almost 17 years ago, and that's how things got started for me. So I would say to everybody out there, you know, it's not just having the passion and the skills to be able to do this, but you're going to hit some obstacles and roadblocks out there that you could never anticipate. Like, how did this happen, and why did this happen? And then you have to figure out how to solve that problem. And, you know, it's become a much bigger, much more competitive environment than it was, you know, 17 years ago. Guys are competing with talent from all over the world for positions that are kind of scattered throughout the world. So you got to keep at it and at it and at it, at, you know, to a pretty uncomfortable level sometimes. And in that process, that's where you get to meet a lot of people. You get to share stories and that's where your network builds Um and that's what's really cool is that, you know, I've been able to work for studios all over the world, um, all the major studios here in the U.S. And, you know, when you go through the trenches with your colleagues and your friends and you see how important art is in their lives and their communities, you get to a point where you start to see, you know, some patterns and you start to see where some of the frustrations are coming from, from the artist's side. And that's another really important thing is that, you know, it's an artful process, and sometimes in contemporary times, it's become more of a business. It's, it's commodified the artists into you know people that are executing a brand, and it didn't used to be that way. You know, it's, films weren't so expensive, uh, telling stories wasn't so complicated, and people were more willing to take risks. And that's kind of what's happening in the outside indie world, and that's where fresh ideas are more welcomed. Um, and that's why I say this is a, a kind of a rebirth of that time, and you have to be able to do things a little bit differently, more quickly, um, and you know, with a real collaborative attitude. And that's where it's a lot of fun once again, which is great.
Yeah, I, I I love it, and I now I completely understand what you're talking about earlier, and I think for me I can see that the the tools and the access to information that we have uh, is so much greater that when I started my career wasn't as long as as yours has been, but when I started there's like if you wanted to learn there was no internet there was like these giant books that you bought and it was 700 pages here's how you yeah, edit right. <laughs> artwork for video games and then you just sat down and either you could sit through a 700 page book or you couldn't yeah, and. Uh, and now, you know, there's all these tutorials, the tools are much better, there's all kinds of groups that you can join and, and connect with other people all over the world. It's such an amazing time. And really, you just have to say, you know, decide what you're going to do and then take that first step yeah, and take the next step after that. Totally. And and don't don't be saddened by rejection from studios. Um, you know, a lot of times it's pretty devastating to get, you know, the sad news. You know, at, currently at this time, we don't see your skill sets, you know, working <laughs> with our production, current production slate. However, we'll keep your name on file, right? I mean, we all get that all the time, um, and that's very common. It doesn't mean that you're not a great artist and that you don't have the skills. It could be any number of impediments that are getting in your way, <clears throat> and you need to just you know, move on to the next one and keep trying and keep slugging, and somewhere out there, you're going to find your start, and it could be social games or video games or the film industry or medical illustration or theme park resort stuff, and I'm just scratching the surface. Um, you know, I'm working on a couple of independent stop-motion films here in the San Francisco area, and you know, those things are just beautiful little, little projects to be involved with. And so you know, if, it needs to make you happy for where your passions are. Um, and eventually you'll be able to find your way with it because it's what you're meant to do. And then all, hopefully, ultimately, you'll get to be able to tell your stories. You know, what, what is personal in your life? What has affected you and what inspires you? And what are, what are really great, you know, stories to tell that are very personal and very intimate? And one of the great things is, you know, the tools are so accessible now. I mean, you can kind of do a lot of work from home and within a small group of people. You can do cloud-based production. I'm talking with a group that just spun out of DreamWorks that's building a studio, a cloud-based studio that enables people to kind of put together talent to build teaser trailers for their own content to pitch to studios, um, stuff like that. And that's what's happening when studios close, right? So DreamWorks out here laid off 500 people. And I'll never forget the day sitting in the room when Jeffrey Katzenberg said, oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> but we have to close this place. Right. And so from that, though, you know, there have been some super talented people that have gone off to other studios or, you know, they've continued and gone down to the L.A. studio and are working on some new stuff there. But also others have gone out completely and started up entirely new things. And they could be technically related. They could be business related. They could be, you know, film narrative or VR. And those are some of the groups that I'm talking with now that are, you know, ex DreamWorks guys that kind of said, you know what? enough of the film industry. You know, we've been telling these same kind of stories over and over again. We want to do something new and different. And they're out there now, you know, going and getting money, getting investors and, and building studios and telling some new fresh stories. So, you know, that's the same tenacity. That's the same kind of attitude. Well, you know, the industry is having its struggles, but it's not, it's not going to affect me and my desire. I'm going to continue doing this because it's important for me as an artist to keep expressing some of my ideas, right? Yeah, definitely. All right. I feel like we, we, we covered now, but I, the, the thing that I, the story that I did want to hear is the story like going way back. And you said that you were, you had started doing some teaching, uh, because you needed to, to find money to pay the bills. I think we can all, or most people can relate to the, being in that situation. For me, it was becoming a line cook at, in a restaurant oh, yeah, great. before I had my first job. It, you know, it got to that point. I thought, I, you know, I had $700 that I'd saved up. I think I was 18 or 19. I had $700 and I thought I was rich. Right. Um, I mean, the money did go farther, 
back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, but it didn't go that far. And uh, so I sat at home and I played video games for like two weeks and then my money ran out. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, money's gone. I need a job. And so, you know, you just swallow your pride and you print out your resume and you go to the the mall and you hand out your resumes and then you become a line cook. And uh, I was there for a month until I was able to land a, you know, graphic design animation job. But you just you just do whatever you have to do to, to pay your bills. And this is where you were. And then, um, and the reason that I think this story is fascinating, um, or, or that I'm interested to hear it is because I, I've recently come across a lot of people that they're in a, a career or in a, a job that they're not satisfied with, and they want to go down a more creative path. And so I know that you had started in art, but then you took a hiatus. And I'm wondering how, I, well, you can tell the story for yourself, but um, I would just love to hear how that all worked out for you. Yeah, well, first, I'd love to sample some of your line cooking. I'd love to see what you <laughs> were putting together. That's awesome. I mean, you know, this is what makes us who and, and what we are, right? And it's so important to have those life experiences because while they're going on, you, you think that it, it has a, a specific meaning of some kind or you might be frustrated or whatever. But in the end, it specifically does have a lot to do with, you know, how you evolve as a person. But so when I graduated uh, art school, I was out there doing some freelance illustration and trying to pay my bills like that. And it was a very different world, right? So I'm, I'm working with Harper Collins, I think it was, uh, doing some young adult book covers, uh, working for various magazines. And, you know, the pay was next to nothing. And, you know, you do the best that you could, you would crank this stuff out. And, you know, it was super frustrating, because there just wasn't enough work. There were a lot of students that were graduating in a super saturated part of the world for illustration. And it was inspiring, but at the same time, just couldn't pay the bills, right? So, my wife and I were, you know, struggling along, you know, newly married, trying to find our way. And she got a uh, master's degree in education. So she was out there teaching and she saw the struggle. And meanwhile, because we were kind of broke, we couldn't afford furniture. We couldn't, you know, buy things. So I was picking stuff up off the street, um, refinishing furniture. And, you know, New York is awesome for that because you can go around a corner and find a great piece of furniture that just needs a leg <laughs> glued back on or something like that. So, we lived in a brownstone apartment, and I would haul this stuff up into our apartment and refinish it, and that's how we started to, you know, accumulate stuff. But, you know, <clears throat> that was sort of fun because you get to learn all these different skills. And so, there was a school at the time that had a, it was a private school that had a woodworking program for kids. And so she knew one of the teachers there, and they were just looking for somebody to fill in for the guy who had been doing it for a long time because he had uh, fallen ill, and they just needed a temporary guy. So I go in there. And I get to work with uh, these uh, elementary school kids, teaching them basic woodworking, right? So we were doing little bookshelves and little toy boats and, you know, just super fun little sculptures working with the teachers. And the teachers were awesome. And this is in New York City, right, in the village. And so it was fun. And it was all of a sudden I'm making some money, right? So I, I went from like $5,000 a year up to ten. <laughs> and I thought, holy <laughs> crap, you know, now I'm making some money. Meanwhile, the art scene is still a struggle, so I would teach all day, um, do some after-school classes, go home and do some of my own personal work in the evenings. And at that time, you know, there was a big boom in construction work in New York and heard about some friends that needed some furniture or some people who needed some drywall work done. So the art sort of faded away, and I started doing those things because that helped to pay our family's bills. We started to have some kids. So, you know, I was traveling through New Jersey and Manhattan doing these construction projects. And I was at that point completely done doing art. And that's all that I was doing. So we ended up moving to New Jersey because it was too expensive to live in Brooklyn and built a sh wood shop out in our garage. And then um, did that for a number of years until uh, Reagan came along and his recession uh, forced all of uh, my family to move back to Pennsylvania because w there wasn't any construction work uh, or enough construction work in New York at the time to, to keep that going because my referral network of architects and designers, they had all lost a whole bunch of business. So mm -hmm. back to Pennsylvania where I grew up and I started working for a carpenter there just trying to get back on our feet for $9 an hour, which was crazy, right? So we had two kids at the time. <laughs> we're, we're living in an apartment trying to figure out how to rebuild our lives and was doing that for a little while, again, not making a whole lot of money, trying to figure out how to pay the bills. And so I opened up a small cabinet shop in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and started cranking out cabinetry. And one thing led to another, met another guy, and 
we combined forces and had a 5,000 square foot furniture shop. So, you know, we're going back, I don't know, 20 years or something now, but I was building kitchens and bathrooms and one of a kind custom pieces of furniture. I was doing decorative painting, faux finishing on walls and furniture. You know, and that's where I was still being creative and using some art skills, but I, I certainly wasn't designing for film or doing anything yeah. like that, right? And this friend of mine calls and he says that, you know, this whole CD-ROM thing is starting up. He knows some publishers uh, that are looking for content, so would I mind doing some pictures for an idea that he had? And I thought, okay, well, maybe now <laughs> I can start doing some some of that again. And I did 10 or 12 sketches for him and he pitched this idea in New York to a developer who said we love it we we want to do it we want to make it right and I thought okay well good luck with that <laughs> you go ahead and, and do it and he said well no I mean I need you to do it I need you to do the stuff <laughs> thought, well, you know it's <clears throat> it's been a long time and like I have a wood shop I have a business that I'm running and he said well you can do both right <laughs> I thought wow okay well maybe we can give this a shot and that's when I first started to learn digital uh, skills because I was traditionally trained. So I was not only running the wood shop, but I was also trying to learn Photoshop and do all this digital art for this CD ROM, which was called Junkland at the time. And that thing ended up getting done and uh, winning a whole bunch of awards. And I thought, well, maybe I can get back into doing art again and it might be able to pay the bills. And had gone through the transition of learning some digital skills. And then we got a call from Disney Interactive because my friend who uh, wrote the Junkland idea had a friend who was working there. And he said, well, we have a, a title we'd like you guys to do called Math Quest, which was one of their edutainment titles. Mm -hmm. So um, he was in New York at the time, um, and I was still in Pittsburgh. And so we ended up working on that project, which was hubbed out in Glendale, California, through Disney Interactive. So... The production studio that made it was in New York. I'm in Pittsburgh, so every week I'm flying to Pittsburgh, or sorry, to New York, working there all week long, coming home on the weekends, hanging out with my family, and ultimately led to me selling the woodworking business to get out of that because now I can pay my bills doing artwork again for, for this Disney Interactive title, which I think I told you ended up leading to the job offer that I declined because CD-ROM was sort of tanking at the time so you know that was a good long period where I just was not doing any art but you know I was paying my family's bills and we were raising kids and you know still being somewhat creative but I still you know deep down had that longing to get back to doing artwork and through that course ended up with this crazy moment at Seagraph with ILM after applying to studio after studio after studio but the same sort of cookie cutter rejection letter thanks very much great work but not the right fit for what we're looking for now um and it ultimately led to the job that i have now so wow that's the crazy story Yeah. So, okay. So I've got a, a few questions that I want to ask about this. So, um, I feel like you, you've always been creative and even though you're doing woodworking, you you still found ways to be creative in that maybe not as creative as you would have liked to, but it was still, it was your creative juices were still bubbling and boiling or whatever you want to say. Yeah, yeah. But, but then when you had that opportunity where somebody said, Hey, can you draw these pictures for me? How did he know to go to you? Like, and and what about your skill level? Because I feel like for myself, even after three or four or five years of being really into 3D, that my 2D skills are just, they're nowhere near the, as sharp as they were, you know, 10 or 15 years ago when I was really into it. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, you know, 
he, he's married to a woman that we've been friends with for a very long time. Uh, his wife I've known longer than I, I knew him. And, you know, she kind of knew our backgrounds as artists. She knew that we'd gone to art school. And, you know, don't forget, I was a printmaker for a while and I had been doing illustration and art on the side. So there was a bunch of that oh, okay. around the house, right? So that that was enough for him to say, you know, you can do a couple of sketches. And, you know, that it was fine. It hadn't totally left me. At the time, because I had been doing, you know, drawings I still had to do for cabinetry design, you know, things like that. I wasn't doing creatures or aliens or spaceships, but I was doing, you know, kitchen cabinets and fine furniture, you know, one-off kind of things. So that there was enough there for him to say, hey, you know, can, can you do these? Uh, that makes sense. And then you just basically went for it. And then one thing led to another. And then uh, th- these projects started to come in and, and, and be successful and which led to the next project and then at that point you're still in the, the sort of like the northeastern US and then you, that's when you decided to apply to these companies you got the rejection letters yep. and then you decided hey I'm going to go to this conference called Seagraph which if you if you don't know what it is and you're interested in, in being in the entertainment industry as an artist, you should look it up and, and see if you can attend it. It kind of travels to different cities, so it might be uh, actually not as far as you think to go to it. But then you went there with your rejection letter and your exact same portfolio. You didn't add or change or do anything. Yeah, you're exactly. just like, here it is. Yeah. And then you showed it, and then the right people saw it, and kind of the rest is history. Yeah, that's pretty much what happened. And I think it's it's standard for a lot of artists. You know, you're coming out of school or – you know, you've been doing something different, and rejection is an integral part of this business. Um, and you know, you have to be able to to deal with it and and move on and not be offended by it. Um, you know, I recently did a project where the studio that I was working for surprisingly was pretty inept at the process of working with a client, and you know, it was pretty disappointing for me that they weren't better informed at how to allow for artists to be successful. Um, there was a lot of sort of technical things that they were doing that were kind of a setup for failure for mm. artists. And, you know, that that's some of the wisdom that you gain over the years. Um, you know, there, there, there's some interesting trickery that's going on out there now where studios will hire you on a, on a contract and you'll work for, you know, a number of weeks or months or something. And in the middle of that, they'll say, well, you know, we, we've had a bit of a slowdown, uh, so we need you to stand down for a couple of days. And so what that means to the artist is, well, wait a minute, we have a contract, right? And so you're paying me. And they said, well, actually, no, we're not going to pay you because we've got a slowdown. We have to wait for our client to uh, bring some more work around to us. And that's hugely problematic, right? Because they're taking money off the table. They're taking food off the table for you and your family. And so when you're in the indie world, there's a lot of things that are going on that you you know need to be careful about your business arrangements with the client, um, but at the same time, you know that that those are some of the dangers that you, you run into. And you know, surprisingly, I've had wonderful experiences for the most part. I've had some some not so good ex, uh, experiences as well, where studios will change their contracts. Uh, they will not honor their contracts. Um, They'll they'll do some pretty uh, unscrupulous things that you got to be careful about, and that's all part of the seasoning that goes into someone who's been doing this for a while. Um, and so I try to advise students and people that are coming up in the industry things to be careful of, people to watch out for. Um, you know, for the most part, you know, there are some studios that are rock solid in the way that they treat you and uh, treat you on a business level and on an ethical level, and there are some that are not. So, you know, it's just the things that you learn. And again, you got to be tena- have the tenacity to be able to work your, your way through all of that and keep seeking out people that are trying to do the very best work and treat you with dignity as an artist. Because oftentimes you, you would know this from the visual effects side, right? A lot of, oh, yeah. Right? A lot of times. They just, Definitely. Right? And when we ran our own business, we, we ran into issues of all, like all the above issues, um, you know, rejection, unscrupulous things, contracts changing, you know, it, 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 it's a trip. But I think the, the most important thing is to remember to enjoy the ride because you probably will look back at wherever you are right now and if you're riding high, it'll be great. You'll, you'll look back at these high times or if you're riding low, you might look back on it still with fond memories of how you were able to 
survive even though it felt like the world was closing in around you. Um, yeah. And I think it, it's really important to keep things in perspective that it's easy to be, you know, you really get caught up in how serious everything is. But then, you know, when you look back in five years, like, well, that wasn't that serious. You're like, that, yeah. that wasn't that, that wasn't that bad. Uh, so if you're enjoying it along the way and you're meeting good people and you're keeping in touch and building your network and make taking time to have fun and enjoying your family, then I think you're, you're, you're on the right path. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I would really urge everyone to remember how precious and important it is as an artist uh, in, in a world that, you know, oftentimes just doesn't really respect it and, and give it the due uh, uh, respect that it, it, it deserves, right? I mean, each of us are uniquely individual in, in our perceptions of the world and what we bring to the world through our art, right? And it's such an amazing gift to have. And oftentimes when you're out there trying to make a living at it, you know, they're, they're using a piece of that component, which is who you are, right? So if you're working for this studio or that studio, you're taking all those skills and all that passion and providing a service to them for their product, right? And, you know, there can be a lot to be learned and, you know, great to be working in a creative environment. It's hard enough to be able to get to that point, right? But don't ever lose sight of the fact that what you have privately, personally, on a very intimate level is precious to you and that you need to nourish that. Um, oftentimes you can get you know, frustrated or exhausted working in the industry, right? And it can be super exciting to work on some shots and you know, do some stuff for, for any number of different you know game studios or film studios and so on but then there's you know who you are personally and to be able to keep doing that kind of work show that work if you can um, get into galleries sell it online share it with your friends show it in the local restaurant nearby because that's mm -hmm. right that's who you really are and that's why you got into this business in the first place and you know I'm, I'm gonna make a plug here sort of uh, for Maker Faire and I don't know if you know who and what that is but well I, I do know what it is but I'm, I'm interested to hear why why you want to plug Maker Faire because I feel like you have a unique perspective I've never been I've only looked at it online so this is something that takes place out here in California at, at its hub um, they're located in Sebastopol but when you go to um, where they have the actual event here it, it, it's like 200,000 people show up to this thing over one weekend and it's you know, families and kids and crazy, wacky people. And what I really love about the spirit of Maker Faire, which is what my partner and I were talking about, you know, 15 years before it was even its own entity, is the spirit of working again with your hands in a really genuine and authentic way. And so when you're in the industry for a long time, you know, you go and you work for Disney or DreamWorks or Blue Sky or some game studio somewhere and, you know, they put out a whole bunch of product that has a certain style and a look to it and you're contributing to that brand when you go there and there's some cool work going on, right? But when you go to Maker Faire and Maker Faire now is global, it's all over the planet, you can round the corner and you go and you look at something that, you know, some woman made out of a garage in Kentucky or some guy dragged all the way over from, you know, Australia and you are genuinely surprised, like blown away by what this object in is that this person made. Like it's breath, it takes your breath away because it's so completely unexpected and so genuine and unique that you go, I want to know more about that. I want to know more about you. Like it, it is so revolutionary and so kind of disruptive in how far out of your expectations these things are. And, you know, some people would say that they're more kind of fine art. Some people would say that they're craft. And I would say, too, check out the, the world of craft, right? And sometimes that, that gets a bum rap because people oftentimes will say, well, it's just craft. It's not really art or fine art and all the rest of it. Well, there's a great crafts fairs that come through San Francisco. They, too, 
you know, these are individuals who, through the, the gifts that they have in their hands, make these things and use their imagination to come up with stuff that is completely unique. And that, that you know, for me really resonates because I've often and often worked with my hands, right? So you're combining your imagination <clears throat> with the act of putting something together that kind of comes, uh, comes from left field completely. And just that's where I get a lot of my inspiration now is looking into that world because, man, I would tell your audience, you know, when you're doing art, don't just think of it as pushing pixels around or paintbrushes or pencils, but sculptures, you know, found objects, uh, picking stuff up and, and creating things in, in new and inventive ways. I and mean, we have this planet full of resources that are just sitting there to be reused in some new and interesting way way and part of my film project that I'm pitching now speaks all about the fact that you know we've got this vast resource of stuff around us that if it's looked at in a new way and put together in a, in a cool way you can you can build worlds with this right and that's what really excites me. I think, yeah, I think that's, uh, it's so important to go out and, and seek inspiration. And um, now I feel like I need to add Maker Fair or, or look if there's a Maker Fair or some of the places that I'm going to be. I don't know if they have one here in Germany, but maybe uh, they probably do. I, I just have to find it or something similar. Um, but yeah, if you're listening and you want to check it out, definitely you can see photos on the website. And if there's one happening in your city, it'd be a great weekend excursion, something very fun and, and creative to do. Um we should wrap this up, Randy. Where's the best place for people to find you online? Uh, well, if you just Google my name, Randy Gall, you'll see me come up as a visual development artist, and you'll see a website there that's a little bit old and dated. Um, I'm also at Zerply, and I don't know if you know about what Zerply is. It's Z-E-R-P-L-Y, and it's a sort of a collective of professionals in the industry, uh, more industry specific that uh, will show artists, many artists now who get to showcase their work. So you can upload your work there. Um, you can share it with people. People can check you out. There are job postings there. Um, that's another way of checking out some work that's sort of outside of what's on the uh, website. Um, and again, there's a couple of stop motion projects. One I really want everybody to take a look at called Cicada Princess. And that's one of the independent projects that was directed by um, Maurizio Baiocchi, Malchi we call him out here, who's a really brilliant guy. Um, that's a sweet little film to take a look at. So, um, And then you know, pay attention next year for uh, Alice in Wonderland 2 through the looking glass. Uh, you'll see some work on that one. Um, and then... Um, Boy, some Transformer Five stuff, but that's not for a while. And uh, and then shopping the the VR world and stuff into the future. So you know, <laughs> we're always looking down the road. Awesome. And uh, would you, would you be okay to, for somebody to reach out to? You? Because I feel like you have so much knowledge, and that if there's somebody listening, and you, uh, well, actually, first I'll ask if you're okay for people to contact you before I uh, talk about this, but. Yeah, God, by all means. I mean, um, I graduated from Pratt Institute in New York, and I am constantly in touch with students there. I really enjoy that and welcome that totally. I'm happy to talk with folks that I can help out in some way. Sure. Awesome. Because, yeah, I just – I feel like uh, I've just written a, a blog article about how much time you should devote to your art and that there's a lot of times when if you had like a, a coach or a mentor or somebody who can really help you navigate the waters that you can take so many shortcuts along the way that what may be, you know, two years of banging your head against the wall and failing could be 
that could be made much shorter and a lot less painful. Um, I mean, I, I feel like there is some merit in, in going through the tough times, but I just, in talking to you, I feel like you have that sort of like mentor coach mentality and, and this really elevated view of what's going on. And that, um, if somebody needed some, some guidance or some direction that you would be a great person to reach out to, that you've seen a lot of things, you know, a lot of people, um, and you can really put things into perspective. So, um, if this is you, uh, you know, don't be shy and, uh, maybe take that first step and just, just see what's, what's, uh, what Randy may, or what you might be able to talk to Randy about, because I, I, I don't know. I just have the sense that you're, you're that guy. You're the mentor guy. And it, <laughs> the mentor I, talk, guy. I, appreciate that. I don't, I don't want to label you as that, but I just, in talking to you and hearing your voice and how calm you are and, and collected and, and all this stuff. Um, Anyway, with, with that said, I, I'll wrap this up. And so we'll also have show notes and links to um, the different projects that Randy had talked about um, at pencilkings.com slash Randy Gall. That's R-A-N-D-Y dash G-A-U-L. So thanks for listening. And thank you, Randy, for this is going to be the longest podcast we've ever done. So oh thank you for, for staying in the line with us and uh, sharing your experience. And uh, I hope it's been uh, good for you. Hey, Mitch, thank you very much for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. And in any way to uh, reach out and help others in, in this community is always my, my honor and my pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Randy. Let's have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.